in the last few weeks, um, the Sunday morning messages have had the same title the last three Sundays, Will You Do What Jesus Says? And uh, I don't want to disappoint you, so we're going to have the same title again today. Uh, this one was much easier to figure out. Uh, listen to the passage that we're in. It's in verse 28, Matthew chapter 21, verse 28. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first, and he said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. Not hard to figure out a title for that message. This, go do this. No. It, the whole, this little parable is about doing what God says. So the first son says, no, I won't go. Verse 29, it says, though, but afterward he regretted it, and he went. And then he came to the second son and likewise, said, likewise, and he answered and said, I'll go, sir, but he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And so they said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Lord, we pray for help. We know that you simplify the great and complicated issues of life in, uh, to just little phrases, simple phrases, such as, will you do what I say? And really, Lord, we might look at something and there's so much backstory, there's so much confusion, there's consequences. We might get the advisors together and begin to try to discuss the political fallout if we decide this or if we decide that. But really, Lord, you've made our lives so simple when you've promised to always communicate with us and your word is filled with communication and then you've given us your spirit who speaks to us. And Lord, really, you've simplified our lives to will we, will we do what you say? And so as you've been repeating this, Lord, as we look again at another aspect of of that message, Lord, that you would help us to understand what your spirit is saying to us. And Lord, that we would truly be people that we just simply do what God says. And if somebody wants to understand our life, we could sum it up by saying, well, this is what God told me to do. And if we have things going on in our life that we can't say, well, God told me to do this, then Lord, that we would make the changes, that we would truly be living those lives uh, that are yielded to Jesus and allowing your spirit to direct us Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this uh, very brief parable takes up only uh, f really three and a half verses. Um, it's very simple. The man had two sons, and uh, one son did what he said, one son didn't do what he said. And the parable begins with the sentence or the phrase, the question in verse 28, what do you think? So Jesus is talking to an audience that is primarily hostile. I mean, the group that he's trying to reach with this parable has, has hardened their hearts towards him. Uh, they've, they've rejected his message. They don't want to hear what he has to say. They're against him. And so he's sort of coming at him in a little bit of a sneaky way using what we would call the Socratic method. He's asking a question. He presents it in a way that the answer is really obvious. There's no way to um, answer it another way. And he sort of sneaks up on them before they can realize uh, that, the, that this little story is devastating to them. They give the answer. And so what do you think? What do you think about this? A man had two sons. One said the right thing, but didn't do the right thing. One said the wrong thing, but he ended up doing the right thing. Well, which one did the right thing? Well, it's, well, the one who did the right thing. It's very basic. The son who actually obeyed his father is the one who obeyed his father, not the one who said the right thing, not the one that, if you looked at the appearance, they appeared as though the one, you know, he's compliant. He's the one that, sure, dad, I'll do it. The appearance was one of obedience, but the actions didn't match his words. And the actions didn't match what it looked like on the outside. So the person who actually obeyed is the one who obeyed. Now you might say, well, that's kind of oversimplifying it. Well, if, you know, or that's such a basic message, why would Jesus spend time on it? It's interesting that as basic as this message is, it seems to be so easily forgotten by people. And I'll just use myself. There are many times where I've been in disobedience and somehow in my mind I sort of think, 
I intended to do the right thing. <laughs> yeah, but I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah, but I really wanted to do the right thing. And, you know, given different circumstances, I probably would have done the right thing because that's kind of how I am. I usually do the right thing. And I planned on doing the right thing, but things turned out the way they turned out, and I ended up doing the wrong thing. But really, I'm actually pretty good, even though I'm in disobedience. There, there seems to be this ability of our human nature to, to sort of, in our brain, filter things or twist things or distort them enough where disobedience actually, we can justify ourselves and and make our own selves feel like, well, I'm actually not doing something that wrong. And that is one of the main issues with the religious group that Jesus is in direct, direct opposition with. That's why the parable comes this way. Because these are men who are saying, we do what God says. And Jesus' point is, no, you don't. <laughs> no, no, we, we are the guys, we do what God says. And Jesus is saying, you don't do what God says. Yeah, but we say all the time that we do what God says. And we've chosen those things that we're willing to do, and we do those. And Jesus' point is, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that God wants you to do that you won't do. And that's actually more important. Actually, if you weight it and, and you put a priority, there is a greatest commandment. The greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. They're tithing out of their garden herbs. They've got their little spice garden, and they harvest some basil to make some pesto, and they're chopping it up and they, they realize there's an amount and they give 10% of that to the Lord. Well, that's fine. But if while you're doing that, you're cheating your mom or, you're, or you have an idol in your life or you're, you're greedy for gain, well, then really, you know, the tithing of your garden vegetable doesn't really mean anything. You've, Jesus put it like this in another place. He said, you've strained out a gnat, but you swallowed a camel. Fine that you strained out the gnat, but, you know, gnat straining doesn't really mean a lot if you've got a camel in your mouth, you know. How, how could that possibly be? But yet, that's, that's the nature of humanity. It's our nature. It's human nature. It's, it's something that you find in every generation. It's something you find in churches, every church. It doesn't matter what denomination. It doesn't matter how Pentecostal they are and how much activity and action is present when they have a worship service or how stoic and staid and formal and how planned out and regimented the worship services are. You'll find this across the board in every part of every church, and you'll find it in every religious group. It's not even, a, it's not even something that only Christians deal with. You'll find this at work. You'll have people at work that fancy that they're the greatest supervisor the company's ever had, while at the same time they're stealing. But they, 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 there's just this way of justifying our actions. And so this overly simple parable of who did the will of his father well the one who did the will of his father like you say well yeah lord we're not in kindergarten and the lord says actually you're right you're not your preschool <laughs> kindergarten is up above you you're not quite ready to sit still in a chair and learn to print out your name that's you're not really there this this is the most basic of all concepts can you see yourself in the light of who god is and are you willing to be honest because there's a group that he's speaking to that's unwilling to be honest they're unwilling to look at themselves truly in, in the light of God and in the light of the recent circumstances. This is the group that has seen Jesus heal thousands of people. This is the group that heard the ministry of John the Baptist and saw the impact of John the Baptist and then rejected it. They've seen the ministry of Jesus and then rejected it. This is the group that has sent armed guards to go drag him out of the temple and arrest him. And the armed guards came back without Jesus and they said, we never heard anybody teach like this man teaches. We went to arrest him and he arrested us. We went there to catch him and he caught us. We walked in and he was speaking and I couldn't think about anything except for what he was saying and how it was penetrating my life. So the ministry of Jesus was obviously powerful, obviously had an impact on so many people and this is the group that is saying no, no. And there's a very real reason why they're saying no. Because in saying no to God, they're saying yes to themselves. They've got a lifestyle. They've got sin. They've got a mode of operation. They've got a whole little system that they've built. And if they choose Jesus, they lose all of that. They lose their life in order to find it. If they're going to find their life, they'll lose it. And they've chosen, I want my life. 
I want the one that I see. I want the one that I have. And I'm not interested in what this person is saying. I don't care if he's raised the dead. I don't care if he's cleansed lepers. I don't care if the blind can see. I don't care if the prophecy's fulfilled. I don't care. I want what I want. I'm going to do what I want. And so to somebody like that, Jesus tells the most basic kind of a parable, simple story. Who do you suppose did it? The one who said the right thing or the one who did the right thing? And the answer quickly comes, well, the one who did the right thing. So then his commentary, he says in verse 31, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Now, at this moment, he lost his audience, we might say. They probably were looking quizzical. They're, they're hostile. We'll, you know, we'll see in the, in the next chapter. This is that the last couple of days of Jesus' life when he's ministering in the temple. And there's a lot of dialogue and, and animosity, a lot of um, questions that are being asked, you know, perfectly designed questions to catch him in his words. And so uh, this is the season when all of this is happening. So he asks, you know, what do you think? And then they give their answer thinking, did, we, did he trap us? Did we, you know, what is he, where is this going? And then when he says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going to heaven and you're not. And that's, that's a way to lose your audience. At that moment, the quizzical looks change to, we hate you. <laughs> we hate you for sure. Like we hate, I hated you before this morning. I really hate you now. We wanted you dead before today. We really want you dead now. He says, why? He said that in verse 32. Here's the reason. John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. Essentially, he's asking another question with that statement. What did you find wrong with the ministry of John the Baptist? What did John the Baptist say to you that wasn't true? What was unhealthy? What was going to change? What was going to be derogatory to the nation? What was it in John the Baptist's ministry and his message, his lifestyle that you would point to and say, you know what, that guy was a bad guy, really. I mean, he was trouble. He was self-interested. He had a political message that, that would take the nation under. What was it that John taught? And, and so John came in the way of righteousness and you didn't believe him. And he says, the tax collectors and the harlots believed him. What was John's message? John's message was, the Messiah is coming, and so you need to get ready, and so you need to knock it off. You need to stop the sin that's in your life. And he preached a message of repentance. There's a huge thing that God's about to do, and you need to be ready for it, so you need to stop sinning. You need to get the sin out of your life. So some people were hearing that, and they knew that they had sin in their life. When John was saying that, they were being convicted. They were thinking of those sins, and they were thinking, you know what? I have been doing this, and I have been doing that, and he's right, and I know that I've been offending God. I've been doing what God told me not to do. I've been omitting what God wanted me to do. I'm living in sin, and John is saying, you need to change right now today. Today is the day for you to make a change. I'm going to go into the river right now, and those of you that want to make this change, and you want to confess your sin and you have recognized God speaking to you, then come into the water, and I will baptize you in the water. And it will be a way for you to say, I'm turning from my old life, and I'm not going to live in sin. I want to be ready because God is sending his Messiah. So you just come out right now. And he walks out into the river, and some guy's standing there, and he's thinking, oh, I've ripped off so many people, and they're even here. <laughs> and I'm a tax collector and that's a cuss word in my language. Hebrew, apparently, I'm not a Hebrew expert, but my understanding from reading those who are, they say that in Hebrew there aren't words to properly cuss, like if you want to cuss someone out. That's why even if you go to Israel today, they use English, as in a lot of places. We, we've transported through our movies and our media our curse words, the English curse words around the world, so you can hear all those choice words anywhere you go in the world. You hear somebody, ba ba da ba ba da ba ba da ba ba da and then one of your words, but it's not a good one. So Hebrew doesn't have any words like that. They don't have any words that are cuss words. It's super interesting. And, and so in those days, in the first century, if you wanted to insult someone in kind of the greatest way, you would say, you tax collector. That's, that was it. Like, it's on if you say that. So here's a tax collector standing at the river, 
And John the Baptist makes his announcement and the guy's heart is beating out of his chest and his palms are getting sweaty and his knees are weak and he's thinking, I'm going to have to. And John's saying, come out and confess your sins. And the guy's thinking, I got a choice. Either I stay here on the shore in my sin or I go out in the water and I just tell everybody and I say it, but I get a chance to have a fresh start. And somebody was the first guy in the water, first girl in the water. There's a prostitute standing on the shore. How she ended up out there at a religious meeting, she's probably thinking, what am I doing out here? How did I get out here? And when John is talking, it feels like there's nobody else there, and John's speaking directly to her, and she's hearing about her whole life, and he goes out into the water, and she's thinking, I, I can't walk out there and say what I do in front of everybody. And in her heart, her heart's beating, her palms are sweating, and she's thinking, if I stay here, though, I miss this opportunity. I can't miss this opportunity. I have to get right with God. Something's happening. And then somebody walks out into the river. And John says, tell us. Tell us who you are and what your story is. And the guy says, well, I'm a tax collector. A lot of, I see some guy, I ripped you off last week, bro, Sorry. I'm a th- I've cheated. I've, I've abandoned my nation. I've given up the hope of Israel. I've joined with our enemies. I've lied every day for I can't even remember how long. I lie, I lie. I can't even remember what's a lie and what's the truth anymore. I have nothing to do with the truth. I'm a cheater. I love money more than I love anything else. I'm on my fourth marriage. I, I don't even like that person. I'm pretty sure she hates me, and this one's probably already over. I'm a mess. I'm a mess. John says, great. (laughs) Dunks him. Man, you can repent, bro. Come out of the water. Who's next? Here comes our prostitute. I'm ashamed. I can't even say it. Just say it, sister. You can say it. I've I've sinned in in ways that I should never have. I've given my body for money and maybe weeping. John would just say, you know, God's doing a work. The Messiah is coming. There's one standing amongst us. He's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let me baptize you now. You can be putting your past behind you. Baptizes her, pushes her down in the water, lifts her back up. Imagine how the person would feel who stood in front of the crowd and confessed their sins and all that guilt and all that shame and went under the water and then they were lifted out. What did they feel like? Do you, you know what they felt like because you've had the experience. What does it feel like to have God say, I'm giving you a new start? I'm just going just gonna to put away the past. How good does that feel? Have you felt the weight of the world get lifted off of you? It's amazing. It's an amazing feeling. The guilt and the penalty of sin taken away because of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, the forerunner, a baptism of repentance. His wasn't a baptism of forgiveness like the Christian baptism, but it's pointing to that in some way. So here's John's message. Jesus tells these guys, listen, John came in the way of righteousness, and you didn't listen because a Pharisee standing at the seashore or the riverside, and he's, John makes his message, and that guy's as convicted as the tax collector next to him. The word of God is powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts, and this guy who's a who's a thief who's stolen thousands, standing next to the guy who's stealing things that belong to God, things that are priceless. You know, maybe a chief priest is out there or it's one of the Sadducees, one of the ruling parties, you know, leading people astray. And he surely is as convicted as the other guy, but how's he responding to it? He's got shield and sword up. And he's battling, rock em, sock em robots with the Holy Spirit. Only he, he... got super glue and glued his head down so I'm how much the Lord's like chuk, 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 you know popping him in the chin he's not gonna it's nothing's gonna happen his heart's hard I'm not gonna listen John says come on out I ain't going anywhere I don't need to be baptized I can see why these people need to be baptized I don't need to be baptized I got nothing to confess really you got nothing you can confess well you can confess lying Nothing at all to confess. You got a prophet in your midst calling the people to get ready for the Messiah who's in your midst, and you got nothing. 
They didn't listen to John. John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you didn't believe him. But, Jesus said, tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you didn't afterward relent and believe him. They actually saw a work of God. They were right there, personally present, when God was doing one of the greatest works he's done in the history of Israel. We have Moses, we have Elijah, we have Jeremiah, we have all kinds of great characters in the Old Testament, great heroes, Deborah, Ruth, Esther. There are these people that in a moment in time, they saw what God was doing, they were part of it. It's all recorded for us. They're, they speak into our lives about trusting God and about obeying God. And these guys lived when one of those characters lived, John the Baptist. They were contemporaries with the last prophet of the Old Covenant. And he had maybe the most amazing ministry of anybody because Moses brought the law. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. John brought us Christ. <laughs> I would rather have John's ministry than Moses's. I'm going to give you the law in 1,500 years after you're broken under it. You might be ready for the Messiah. John's, John's message is, here he is. There, right here. I just baptized him. He's the one. So John has this amazing ministry. The nation responds to it. So many people come out and their lives are changed. And these guys saw all of it. They saw people's lives changed. Have you seen someone's life change? It's amazing. So encouraging. Someone that was in love with sin, but now they're in love with God and their heart towards sin has changed. Someone where sin had a hold of them and they tried to get out of that grip and they never could and then Jesus set them free and they were just ripped out of the grip of sin and their lives were totally delivered and changed. Seeing a changed life, so encouraging. They'd seen it hundreds of times over. Tax collectors and sinners who are different. You know, you see a tax collector, you hate him because he's a cheater. Not, you don't like paying taxes anyways. We live in a place where we pay taxes and we voted for the people that are taxing us. So, I mean, it's hard to complain about it because you voted for that guy. You've put the person in office. You don't like it. We live in a place where you gotta, we have this amazing voice. We live in this republic, this dem democratic process. But listen, what if you live in a place where you've been conquered by another nation and they find some turncoats from, from your people and they say, look, this is how much we want and whatever you get on top of that, that's for you. And so then these guys just go around ripping everybody off. I mean, it's one thing that you don't like paying taxes. Can you imagine paying those kind of taxes? You'd hate these people. You'd be a zealot. You'd be, you'd be all about overthrowing the government because you almost are some of you anyways. <laughs> so now the tax collector, you see him, and he looks different. And he's not cheating. And remember when Levi, when Jesus went to Levi's house and he got up and he announced, they had a big feast and all of his friends were over and Levi got up and said, anybody that I've cheated, I'm going to pay you back. I'll pay you back four times what I cheated you. Come. I got a second set of books. We'll look over them. I got the real books and then I got the real, real books. So you just come and talk to me. If I've cheated you in any way, I'll pay you back four times. You imagine having one of your cheating friends act like that? Some of you guys have cheaters as friends. The guy that's borrowed your stuff and never brought it back. Imagine a U-Haul pulls up in front of your house. Here's all your stuff I borrowed over the years. But I lost some of it and broke it, so I bought you all new stuff. You go, where's my cheating friend? What happened? What's, what's, what did, who did you rob? What's the story here? What's behind this? Seeing one person's life change will blow you away. What about when the prostitutes are no longer prostituting? And the tax collectors are now honest. What happens when the cheaters are no longer cheating and the liars don't lie and you see all of it happening hundreds of times over, and then you yourself won't recognize that God's trying to do a work in your life. I mean, this is a heavy message to them. This, this parable is a rebuke to part of the audience. The part of the audience that considers themselves good people. This is kind of a hard thing about the ministry of Jesus. The people who thought of themselves as good people, they really weren't that interested in Jesus. That's kind of sad. Because they're good people. They work hard. Generally, they do the right thing. They're mostly kind. They don't go out of their way being mean to people. They're not spiteful. They're, they're not out of control. 
They live a, a life right between, sort of mostly between the boundaries, and they go along and they're a good person. And the people that were good people, they really weren't that interested in Jesus. And here's part of the problem. The Bible says there is none good. No, not one. There's none. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. James said it like this to, to give us an understanding in our relationship with the law. He said the law is a package deal. If you're guilty with, of one part of the law, then you're guilty of the whole law. So the person who's guilty of breaking a heinous crime, which we would consider with great consequence, a murder, an adultery, or one of those kind of things, we'd look at them and, we'd, and we would want to have them have a greater punishment. we say, well, you've murdered. That's different than the person who, uh, you know, just steals gradually, little by little from his work, not very much, you know, over the course of his life, maybe only three or $4,000 over his whole work career. You know, that guy, what he's doing as a thief is not nearly what the thief does who does armed robbery and actually murders someone when he's armed robbery. So in our judicial system, armed robbery has this penalty, embezzling has this penalty, embezzling this amount has this penalty. Before God, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, before God, you break the law, you're a lawbreaker. You switch clubs. You can't say, well, I break the law in the cool ways of breaking the law that aren't really that bad. So I'm in the the, the, the mostly non-lawbreaker club that's full of good people. James would say, if you've broken the law, then you're a lawbreaker. The difficulty for a person who's a good person is the ability to recognize um, that my need for a savior, because I really don't think I need a savior. Most of the time, that is based upon comparing themselves with people like me. People that are good people that I went to high school with and when I got saved and I started trying to share my new faith with them, <clears throat> everybody told me, Rich, I'm really glad you found something because you needed to find something because you were out of control and your life was a mess and you were going nowhere fast and you probably would have died if you kept going the road that you were going. You needed to find something, but I don't need Jesus. Like, how can you not need Jesus? You've sinned, but they're comparing themselves to me. And they think, I don't sin like you at all. You're totally selfish and you're out of control. Yeah, but you're selfish too. No, I'm not. I'm selfish in a good way. I'm selfish in a nice way. You know, there's nice ways of being unkind and selfish, right? Have you ever had somebody tell you no and you thought, they're so nice? I mean, wait a minute. They just told me so. It, but there's a nice way to say it. You can say it nicely. There's also the person that says it in an unkind, untoward, evil way person this person appears good but there's none good so the in the ministry of Jesus the good people they don't think they need Jesus that's why Jesus would say I didn't come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance in fact he said if you don't recognize that you have a need my ministry is not really for you it's kind of sad isn't it don't you think that there would be a group of people that would say we don't need Jesus and Jesus would say fine I grew up at the beach in Southern California, or pretty close to the beach. So we were at the beach a lot as kids growing up and um, swimming and then later surfing. And, and so becoming familiar when the surf gets to be a certain size and there's rip currents and um, seeing a lot of people drown or, you know, coming to the point of drowning and having to be rescued, you know, lifeguards on big day, you know, jumping off the pier to try to get into where the guys are. And, 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 and so Watching people in the place where, you know, you, you're watching. I've, I've had people go past me in a rip current while I was on my surfboard. You okay, buddy? You want me to call the lifeguard? No, I'm fine. They're swimming as they're swimming backwards, you know. <laughs> like, I don't think you're fine, dude. You want me to, I can, I'll wait for him to come. And, no, I'm doing it. I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> it's that kind of a thing. Like, I'm a good person. <laughs> yeah, you know, you're in a rip current and the current's faster than you can swim. And though your motion makes you think you're swimming this way, the water is pulling you, and you're swimming backwards. You're swimming frontwards, but backwards. You're in a river. You're in a current in the ocean. You're going to die. The fact that you won't admit that you're going to die does not change the reality that you're going to die. Do you understand? The fact that someone won't admit that they need Jesus does not mean that they don't need Jesus. The fact that someone says, well, I don't think I need a Savior, that doesn't mean they don't need a Savior. It just means they're unwilling to admit that they need a Savior. 
And that's, to me, so tragic. Here's a group when Jesus says, look at who does the will of God? The knucklehead kid who says, I ain't going to do it. Who would say such a thing in first century Palestine, by the way? Nobody. They wouldn't say that. It would just wouldn't happen. So uh, who, is, you know, who did the will? The knucklehead who says no, but then later on goes and does it? Or the really nice, sweet kid who goes, yeah, sure, Pop, I'll do it. And then something else comes up and he doesn't do it. Who's the, who's the righteous one? Who's the obeyer? Well, the answer, well, the one who obeyed is the one who obeyed. So they were saying the right things. And in some sense, you'd say they were doing the right things, at least outwardly. But when it came to actually surrendering their life to God, they had no interest in it. There are some people who are, who are still like that. They, they say the right things. And they mostly do the right things, but when it comes down to actually letting God be in control of their life, they got no interest whatsoever. Their, their interest in doing what God says goes as far as what God says coincides with what, what they want to do. <laughs> when, when God agrees with them, they'll obey. When God disagrees with them, they got no interest in that. These guys were lawbreakers, no doubt. They were Pharisees who fasted twice a week. They paid tithes of everything that came in. But Jesus told about the man who went to pray, another parable, the man who was a Pharisee who considered himself better than the other man. I thank you that I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of everything. I'm a righteous person. I thank you that I'm not like that other man, that sinner over there. And the man that was a sinner is beating his chest. He won't even lift up his eyes to heaven. And Jesus said, that man went to his house justified rather than the other. Why? Because the other guy was proud. There are, Proverbs says there are seven things which God hates. Six things which God hates. Seven that are an abomination. The first one is what? Do you guys know the verse? You just start reading your Bibles. Become self-righteous. I mean, you'll battle it, but at least you'll be able to battle it. A proud look. God hates that. So if a Pharisee walks around and sees everybody, hey, better than you, better than you, better than you, and you, and you. I love church. I just love coming. I feel so good about my righteousness when I come. And I walk in, I have a proud look. What's a proud, proud look? God says, I hate that. Well, I love it. How can I love something that God hates? Well, that's sin. So if a person is tithing and fasting and doing all these things, and they're filled with pride, and they have a proud look, and they judge everybody else, then guess what? They might be the most guilty of all. But they wouldn't see it like that. They would say, no, I'm not like these other people. So they would say the right things, do the right things, at least outwardly. And Jesus, with this little story, is sneaking up on them before they realize it. If he starts with, hey, I got an announcement to make. Tax collectors and harlots are going to heaven and you guys aren't. Any other questions? No, he says, I got a story. A guy has, I want you to think about it. A guy has two sons. He goes to the one kid and he says, go work in the vineyard. And the kid says, no. Then later he thinks, oh, I shouldn't have said that to dad. I'll go. And he goes. The other kid says, yeah, Pop, I'll go, and then doesn't go. Which one did the will of his father? Oh, the one who did the will of his the one who obeyed, the one who went. What are you getting at? Okay, here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm getting at. John came in the way of righteousness, and you didn't do what he said, and you saw these other people, they were responding to it, and even when God was doing a work in their lives, you still wouldn't open your heart and let God do a work in your life. They're going to be in heaven and you're not. That's heavy. Now, if I tell you you're going to be in heaven or that you're not going to be in heaven, it doesn't really mean a lot. But if Jesus tells you you're going to be in heaven or not going to be in heaven, it means everything. He's the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. So if he's the way and he says no way, if he's the one that through him everyone can come to the Father or not come to the Father, and he says, you're not going to enter in, then you're not going to enter in. See, we can only speak about salvation as we're quoting Jesus because he's the only one who could speak on it authoritatively. So if you came to me and said, I'm a really pretty good person, and I, and I heard your message today, and I don't know that I agree with it. I think I'm actually pretty good. I know some of the people from your church. I work with a couple, and they're, they're obnoxious. And I'm way better than them. And I said, well, yeah, I know them too. You are. Oh, I'm just kidding. I would say, no, no one at our church is like that. It must mean some other Calvary Chapel, Laguna Creek. 
That one that used to meet in the school? Yeah, that's not us. <laughs> we have a building. You say, well, yeah, you know, you know what? You're right. You are pre actually pretty good, you know. Uh, so I, you're right, actually. You know, Jesus is wrong, and I think I agree with you. I think you're going to heaven. You know, forget what I said. Jesus is wrong. You and I are right. Okay, well, you live your life. You die. And I'll be standing there saying, hey, here I am. You know, you get to go in. We were right. Jesus, he was wrong. That's not, when you die, what's going to happen? Who, you, who do you meet when you die? God. The real God. Not the one that people invent. Not the one that they've conceived of. The real person. God who exists, who made the heavens and the earth, who sent his son into the world to die on the cross, who spoke the truth to you and told you the truth. And you'll stand before him, and he might even remind you of a day like today, a day when you heard about how to get saved, and you said, well, I don't think I need to be saved. I don't think I need a savior. I actually think I'm pretty good, especially compared to other people. Or actually, I'm righteous and churchy people are the unrighteous, or whatever people justify it. Listen, you stand before Jesus and give an account to Jesus. He's the way and the truth and the life. When he says this to them, you're not going to be going into heaven, and they are. That's a rebuke, pretty heavy rebuke from the one person who can speak authoritatively on the issue. You're on the wrong side of things, he says. You're not going in. Now, part of the audience, it was a rebuke. To another part of the audience, it's amazing. Because while Jesus is saying this, he's in a very public place. He's probably in Solomon's porch, that southern area, southern part of the Temple Mount area. Huge, giant porticos in the shade, where as you came into the gates, it's the outer part of the temple. There would be thousands of people that could congregate there. So a lot of this is happening in a very public square, a very public forum. So when he says this, there's probably a lot of maybe tax collectors that are there and maybe prostitutes that are in the audience and and when they hear him say, in verse 31, I say to you, tax collectors and harlots, enter the kingdom of God before you. And you're a tax collector. Wouldn't you think, well, that's amazing. <laughs> that I get to go at all in the kingdom of heaven, much less before someone else. Because I probably think I'm at the end of the line. You know, when we're lined up to go into heaven, and I look behind me, and there ain't no one behind me. <laughs> I'm in, if, I, if I get in the line and I get to get in, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be way near the back. You know, he's a tax collector. I'm not going to be in front of anybody. And Jesus said, these guys are going in, and you guys aren't going in. Now, to the tax collector and the prostitute to think, there's a way for me to be able to be saved. That there's a son who said, I won't do what you say. That speaks so disrespectfully to their father. That rejects their father's will. That would say no to their father that would know clearly what the Father wants done, and then to say so boldly, I won't do it. And to have the story not end with, that person was taken to the city gates, and according to the law of Moses, was stoned to death. Which might be a verse you want to share with your kids, you know, and they're disobeying. Fish it out of the lot. The rebellious, you know, it's, it was a capital crime. Didn't have a lot of teenage rebellion. You know, you could you take him to the gates, go, this kid's rebellious, I won't listen. Okay. You got evidence? Oh, yeah, everybody around us knows. Okay, let's stone them. <laughs> I don't know that they ever did it, but. So, tax collectors and harlots, we said no to God. We said no. We told them no to his face. God said it was sin. How do you become a tax collector? What happens to you? Do you just... Do you just grow up thinking, I'm going to be a tax collector. I just can't wait to betray my nation and have my mom so disappointed. I can't wait to the moment when they kick me out of the house and say they don't want to see me anymore. I can't wait till I've gone so far and they say, look, at, until you change, don't come back. You know, those journeys that we go on that lead to such pain, they happen so incrementally. They're these little steps that get taken where, you know, you, you see a person and they start to experiment with drugs and you give them a warning. You say, listen, man, no, I'm in control. You know, that's not going to happen to me. Well, it's going to happen to you. It's not going to happen to me. And then incrementally the steps are taken and the warning signs are given and God calls out. And I don't listen when God calls. And 
God warns me and I don't listen to the warning and I just keep going down that incrementally making my journey down a path till I find myself doing things that I never thought that I would ever do. Unspeakable things. Things that, that are so embarrassing. Things that you're so ashamed of. And you think, how in the world did I get here? How did I end up like this? I, I'm not like this. Well, yeah, I'm like this now. Here I am doing these things. How does it happen? You think of the tax collector and everybody hates him. And he's got his money and he's captured by it and all the emptiness and lowliness of an immoral life. And to have Jesus say, you did it, you get a second chance. Or a prostitute. Do young girls dream about being prostitutes or do they dream about being princesses? Do they dream about, you know, the circumstances of their life that are going to lead them to a place where this is all I can do or the nature of the cult? I mean, it's obviously always very complicated, but to have be that person that said, I've decided and then I decided and then I decided, God was warning, I had this opportunity to get, and then I just kept going, and now here I am, and what am I doing? How did I get here? And to have someone come along and say, you can get a second chance. This isn't who you are. I can rescue you out of it. This won't define you. This won't be the statement in total of what your life is. Come to me. John the Baptist come in and saying, you guys can confess and repent. Come out here and be baptized. And they went out. Jesus comes along and he preaches a message of setting people free, a message of forgiveness, that they could be forgiven and have hope for a new beginning. Have you ever been convicted that you weren't doing what God wanted you to do? Have you ever had the Holy Spirit saying to you, you know you're letting this thing be part of your life. You know it's wrong. I've warned you not to do it. And you not only have done it, but you've continued on in it. And now it's got its hooks in you and you're in bondage. Let me set you free. Stop. Get out of it. And that, that second, that son, the one that was apparently disobedient. And Jesus said, but afterwards he regretted. He thought and he said, I'm not gonna, I don't want to be like this. And he, and he was able to return he was able to actually be the one that obeyed Jesus gives a second chance sinners get to go to heaven that's a marvelous thing about heaven it's going to be filled with sinful people sinful people who got saved and their sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus if there's none good no not one then heaven is populated by all sinners <laughs> entirely the whole population people that got saved by Jesus now, when he says the tax collectors and the harlots enter in before you, he's not saying that it's their tax collecting that qualifies them for heaven. Don't misunderstand. Sin always wounds, it always disappoints, and it always leaves scars. Those of us here that have sinned, and you have the scars, you have the wounds, and you can, you can remember the pain, you remember the emptiness, you, you see the damage that's happened that you can't get back, the disappointment, the loss. Sin always wounds and disappoints and scars. And there's no glory in sinning in a spectacular way. There's nothing glorious at all about it. The glory is in that God forgives sinners. If we had someone come up and share their testimony, and they said, I was a tax collector, and I was a prostitute, and I was a thief, and I actually even murdered, and I was evil, and I had all these things in my life, and they shared, and they said, I gave my life to Jesus. He forgave me for everything. And... And I'm just so amazed when we all clap and say, wow, praise the Lord, that was awesome. And then another person gets up and they said, listen, I was raised in the church. My parents are believers. They love the Lord. They love each other. I was raised in a godly Christian home. I only always knew about Jesus. And every day I was faced with the challenge of being self-righteous. I struggled with it. I actually became very self-righteous. I didn't see that I needed Jesus. I'd hear other people tell stories like the guy before me talking about how sinful he was. And I would think, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. And I grew up like that. And then Jesus met me on a day and he told me that I needed to get saved <clears throat> and he reminded me of my sin and I confessed it and I repented and he came in and he forgave me and I got saved. We would, wouldn't we clap just as loud? <clears throat> the miracle is not in the spectacular sin. The miracle is in that anybody gets saved. That a self-righteous person could get saved. That Saul of Tarsus. The righteousness of the law, he was blameless. Sin is always destructive. 
<coughs> and it's not the sin that brings the glory, it's the grace. Now also, it's not the prostitution that qualifies the girls or the boys, the prostitutes. It's not their prostituting that, that qualifies them for heaven. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 7 while I try to fix my voice. Luke 7, verse 36. I ate a box of dots last night when I was watching TV. And uh, I think there's so many chemicals in there, it's not good for you. <clears throat> Don't buy me a box of dots, by the way. Don't go, oh, he likes dots, I'm going to buy them. Don't. <laughs> I wasn't like, that wasn't a fishing line trying to get somebody to bring me a box of dots. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat at his house with him. He went to the Pharisee's house and he sat down to eat. Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, it doesn't say she was a prostitute, but we'll just call her a sinner. She'll serve our, for our purpose. A woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus was at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil. She stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, and he said, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who's touching him, because she's a sinner. There's our attitude right there. That's what we're talking about. I'm not like her, and I can't believe he would let someone like that even touch him. It's like, Bro, you don't know Jesus. <laughs> you don't know yourself, and you don't know her. You don't know anything. You don't know anything that's happening right now. <clears throat> he said it to himself. It's in his own mind. Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. So he said, there was a creditor, a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii. The other owed him 50. When they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, which of the two will love him more? Simon said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. So he said to him, you've rightly judged. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. This woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time that I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, listen to this, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. If you're sitting at the table and Jesus is dishing up forgiveness, you don't say, who's he to dish up forgiveness? You say, hey, can you put some on my plate? <laughs> you're giving out forgiveness. Can I, lady, give me some of your oil. <laughs> you get, I want to be forgiven. You don't answer by saying, who does he think he is to go around forgiving people? If, you're, if you know you need to be forgiven, you're begging for forgiveness. Now listen, when Jesus said, you didn't wash my feet, you didn't give me a kiss, and you didn't anoint my head with oil, that would be the common greeting that you would give to anybody that came to your house. Essentially, Jesus is saying, you gave me a great disrespect when I arrived at your house by not washing my feet, by not anointing my head with oil, by not even giving me a kiss. When I came to your house, it was like I reached out my hand to shake your hand and you <laughs> busted me one of those. Well, okay, well, thanks. I'll come over to your house. You disrespect. Listen. He has God coming to his house for dinner. Hey, God, have a, you can sit over there. You wash, are you going to wash your feet? Sit down, God. Just eat what's put before you and quit complaining. Can't believe he's letting that woman touch him. Who's, who's, which is worse? Whatever this woman's done, is it as bad as disrespecting Jesus to his face? Well, it's the same, isn't it? This guy's telling God no. She told God no. It's the same thing. 
So he's not quite as righteous as he thinks he is. It wasn't her prostitution or her sin that qualifies her to have her sins forgiven. It was her response to the ministry of Jesus. Jesus is in the forgiving business. He came to forgive sins. He didn't come to judge. He came to save. Sin separates us from God. Sin kills us. But as in our passage, those that were once lost are now found. They were dead, but now they're alive. Remember in Luke chapter 15, this, where we have the story of the, of the lost coin and the, the lost sheep and the lost son, the prodigal son story. In that passage, when Jesus tells those stories, and he talks about the lost uh, coin and the lost sheep and the lost boy, he says there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous who don't need repentance. Why is that? Because something was lost is now found. All of heaven rejoices when it happens. In heaven, whatever's going on, and someone on earth who was in sin, they get saved, everybody stops, and they celebrate. They rejoice, they're blown away, because someone who is dead is now alive. Sin kills. They were separated from God. Now they're part of the family. A tax collector's coming to heaven. Woo! They're excited, they're stoked out of their minds. The angels, the living creatures... We're in the book of Revelation, we're in that heavenly scene. All the glory and the majesty of God and the angels in heaven rejoicing when somebody who is dead in their sins comes to their senses and said, I need a savior too. I need Jesus. So sin kills, but Jesus saves. And God has made a way for uh, us who are guilty and condemned to be saved. If you're here and you're guilty, we want to invite you to receive forgiveness. If you're sitting in your seat guilty we want to let you know you can leave different you can be forgiven you don't have to have that guilt if you're here and you're condemned if you condemn yourself if the devil's condemning you and you're sitting in your seat you're thinking i'm condemned we can offer you in jesus name pardon so no longer condemned but actually pardoned if you're here and sin has you under its power And even you hear about this and you go, I know I'm a sinner, but sin is powerful. And I've sinned in such a way, I don't think I can escape it. It has its hold on me. Jesus came to set captives free. He said, if you'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus, if you're in bondage to sin, Jesus can set you free. He can set you at liberty. He can release you. He can do it and he will do it. That's what this little passage is about you know in our in our verse back in Matthew 21 there's a group that says we don't need a savior but there's another group that says oh we really need a savior we really need one we need him desperately and Jesus said those tax collectors those prostitutes the people that you think they got no place in heaven I'm telling you they're going in how can that happen how can sinners be forgiven because God paid the penalty for sin, which is death, by offering his own son, and Jesus died. He didn't die figuratively, he died literally. He didn't come down as an apparition who appeared to have died, but he never actually became flesh. Jesus was flesh and blood, and in his body, while he was hanging on the cross, he endured the penalty for sin. One of his final statements from the cross was the little word, to tetelestai, and it means finished. Why would he say that? Because what was necessary to pay his, the, the, the debt of sin, that holy, sinless life of Jesus, he, en- he endured the cross. He bore in his own body our sins. God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. So that Jesus could stand before a group of people and say, listen, a man had two sons. Which one do you think obeyed him? <laughs> and some guys are going, well, well we don't listen to you. And other people are going, you're awesome. (laughs) It's always going to be like that. And it's sad. The self-righteous miss out, but the sinners receive and they get saved. Psalm 145, verse 14. I've been reading, thinking about this. I read this in my devotions. And I want to give you a couple of ways to apply this morning's message. First of all, Psalm 145, verse 14 says... The Lord upholds all who fall, and he raises all who are bowed down. If you're looking for ministry, 
Look for people that are on the ground. I'm not saying that we don't minister to people who are upright. We do. We minister to anybody, everybody. But the Lord upholds those who fall down. When you see someone who's fallen, don't look at him and cross by on the other way. We just were reminded uh, about the Good Samaritan. Um, don't see the person in need who's fallen and passed by on the other side. If the Lord upholds those who fall, his ministry is for the fallen. Look for people that have fallen and give them a message of hope. They're, they're the people that are the most open. The next phrase, the Lord raises up all who are bowed down. You're looking for a ministry? Look for the people that are bowed down. See somebody under a heavy weight. Look for the person that their back is breaking. Their legs are about to give out. They're bowed down. They've, Jesus came not for the righteous, but for the sinners. So if we're his body and we're the extension of his ministry, and he's going to offer the kind of second chance that he's talking about in our parable, the son told his dad to his face, I won't do it, and then later came to his senses and went and did it, and that's the good guy. The one who, who took his second chance. God gives second chances. I just want to encourage you to keep your eyes open for those who need a second chance. Keep your eyes open for those who need a second chance. Don't look at them the wrong way. See them through the eyes of Jesus. Don't look at yourself and compare yourself with them and then justify yourself. That would be folly. But if the Lord upholds those who fall and he raises up those who are bowed down, then if I want to be in the middle of what he's doing, then I need to look for people who've fallen and who are bowed. Get in the middle of there. The Lord wants to hold them up. So get in there and do the hold up the fallen ministry. Lift up the bowed down ministry. Find them. And then, since this is the fourth uh, Sunday morning message in a row that the Lord's directed me to a passage uh, specifically about recognizing the voice of God and then my response to it. I mean, this parable is specifically about that. A man had a son. He told him to do it. The kid said no. But then he went and did it. Thought about it. Changed his mind. Went to his other kid. Do this. He said, yeah, sure, I'll do it. But then he didn't do it. The parable is all about hearing and obeying. And now, four Sundays in a row, the Lord's saying sort of the same thing to us. So, I would just assume then, like when I tell my kids, hey, I need you to clean your room. And if I say it again, what does that mean usually? It means they didn't clean their room. I mean, I'm not being a rocket scientist here, but follow me. And then if I say to them again, hey, I thought I told you to clean your room. You need to make sure you clean your room. And then I tell them four times in a row to go clean their room. What is that? What can you tell? Maybe they didn't go clean their room. Right? Right? So if we have a Bible study four weeks ago and the Lord said, will you do what Jesus says? And then the next Sunday morning, we have a Bible study that says, will you do what Jesus says? And then the next Sunday, we get a Bible study that says, will you do what Jesus says? And then the next Sunday, we get a teaching that says, will you do what Jesus says? Then you better start praying for your pastor to obey. You better pray that I'll listen to Jesus. You better, because Jesus is speaking to us. Will I do what he says? You better check yourself. Is the Lord speaking really clearly to you about something and you're just not listening to him? Then don't do that anymore. You see, the son in the story, he had said no. His dad said, go do this. And he said, I ain't going to go do it. So maybe there's been something going on in your life and there's this struggle and God's telling you what to do and you've just been saying no. Could I just encourage you from this story to say, you know what? This guy said no, but then he relented. He repented. He had a change of mind, and he said, you know what? I, I think I'm going to go do it. If the Lord's been telling you to do something, could I just encourage you to just do it? Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with us. That personal relationship comes through his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead. We're born again. The Spirit of God's living inside of us. That's so we can have communication with God, relationship with him. He's going to be telling you what to do. Be that person, not who says, I'll do it, but be the person that actually does it. And if you've been sort of struggling and God's telling you to do something and you've been saying no, I just want to encourage you 
Today would be a good day to start doing what he says. Tomorrow will be too late. Do you understand what I'm saying? Tomorrow might be too late for you to have your opportunity to start doing what he says. So start today. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You have no idea. You don't know what will happen in the world community tomorrow. Before you wake up in the morning, what will have taken place around the world that will change our lives completely forever? We don't know that. September 10th, you woke up just fine, 2001, thinking everything was great, thinking about the start of a new school year, how awesome it was, how exciting all the things God's doing. I was at a pastor's conference, had a great day of of, uh, hanging out at the pastor's conference, Amazing time in the Word. Woke up in the morning and the world was different. Something happened on September 11th that year that changed everything. You can't wait till tomorrow to decide you're going to start doing what Jesus says. Before you get out of your seat, you need to repent and say, Lord, I'm that dumb son. (laughs) Not the dumb one who said he'd do it and then didn't do it. I'm even dumber than that. I'm the one who told you no. I said no. And you're right, and I'm going to do what you say. Make, make it right with the Lord right now, because tomorrow it's going to be too late. Father, we pray for help. We pray, God, that uh, recognizing that you're speaking, not wanting to um, overemphasize that, Lord, I guess, or underemphasize it, but there's a certain reality, Lord, that you've, you've been emphasizing something as we're going through this part of Scripture uh, about... Um, you speaking to people and and they're listening we've looked at another aspect of it this morning Lord and we've seen one group that says yes but then doesn't do it another group that says no but then has a change of heart change of mind and then does it the one who did the will is the one who did the will and so Lord I want to pray if there's those that have said they'll do something in their talk they talk it but they don't do it Lord may I pray they would have a change of mind and start listening to what you say and doing it. There's been those that are here that have been saying, no, I will never do that. That today would be the day, not tomorrow, but Lord, right now, today would be the day that they agree. And they say, I, I give it up to you, Lord. I'm, I repent. I change. Give me the power, Lord. I'm going to be different. Lord, help us not to confuse ourselves. Lord, make it really clear by your spirit in each person's heart. In Jesus' name, amen.